there has been, probably forever, but certainly in the last seven to ten years, uh, significant division even in the church around politics. <clears throat> and there's always been division around politics, but in, in some generations and in some parts of the world, uh, churches like ours have been able to submit politics to the lordship of Jesus and the unity of the body of Christ. Uh, less and less this seems to be the case. And so as we're looking at this new series, which we're calling Burnt, uh, why people leave church or leave the faith, we're going to be looking at uh, some of these, I mean seven really, of the main reasons people have given in the West, in, in Australia in particular, uh, we don't have data for Adelaide specifically other than anecdotal, like the people who you will know, um, people in your workplaces or neighbourhoods or families maybe, um, pe- people in your sporting clubs, people that you know from around the place or whatever, uh, your, your barber, hairdresser, whatever it might be, um, reasons people tend to give for this is why I've left the church. Things like, well... I might still believe in God, but he let this bad thing happen to me. I I, I hate hate the guy. Or like one guy said to me at university, I don't believe in God, but I hate the bastard. And I'm like, I'm sensing some cognitive dissonance here. Uh, We're going to be looking at um, abuse in the church. And man, there 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 has been some... Uh, I mean, just evil um, uh, activity uh, under the banner of Christianity and in the name of Jesus. Uh, We're going to be looking at a a lot of, I mean, a bunch of things like this. Today we're going to be looking at politics. Uh, There was a recent study by Barna, which is a research institute, uh, of pastors who were thinking about quitting their jobs, which... Apparently, in the post, or you know, almost post-COVID world, there are a lot of pastors who are keen to ditch their jobs. 38% of pastors who were thinking about leaving their job as a pastor cited political division in their church as the main reason that they want to leave. Now, I'm not commenting on pastors today. Um, what I'm commenting on is the trend that if there are four in ten, two in five pastors who are thinking of quitting their job because of the disunity in the church, not on doctrinal issues, not on the best way to reach the lost and serve the poor, but on, here is my preferred brand, policy, personality or tribe of politics, and it's different to yours, so we cannot have unity in the body of Christ any longer. This is, a, this is a terrible place to be in. I, I, I mean, genuinely, I, I see things like that, and I thank God that City Light Church uh, seems to, by God's grace, have been spared largely from, from a lot of that. In fact, I know for sure there are people in our community, in our family, who are very big supporters of lots of different kinds of parties, or even members of different parties, or even representatives in at least one party. And so, uh, and yet we can still gather, love one another, um, submitting our politics to both the lordship of Jesus and to the unity of his body. What I want to look at today is, uh, why is politics such a big divisive thing? You already know this. I want to talk specifically within the church. Uh, and then also, how do, we, how do we guard ourselves or safeguard our community from getting anchored to a political, or even yourself as an individual, from getting anchored to a political party or personality or policy in a way that leads to disunity or breaking of fellowship? This one today is much more about uh, my politics has made me leave my church or even the church more so than leaving the faith. Some of the other ones we'll see uh, in future weeks like, well, I'm a a person of science now, I'm not a person of faith. 
has left people to leave not only the church but also the faith. This one, much more. People leaving the church and <clears throat> joining with another church more aligned with their political persuasion, even at the expense of theological alignment, where people would prefer to be in a church community with people who think like them politically rather than people who think or believe the same as them theologically, the things about God, about Jesus, who he is, what he's come to do. I know for sure we've had people who have left, or at least a person, um, who has come to City Light over the last few months and then left City Light because of uh, something that they hold politically to be of, of high importance to them, uh, the, that theologically we don't share, and has moved on to uh, find somewhere that aligns with them politically, even though from a community and otherwise theological perspective, loved, still like, like grieved leaving. But it's like, no, my politics trumps my theology. So first, let me, I haven't even got to the intro yet. That's not the intro of the intro. <laughs> let me pray. I promise, I've said to Beck before the gathering today, I, I feel underprepared, and I've said this to a few people, underprepared today, not because I don't know enough about this topic, but because I have so much that I would love to share about this topic, but I promise you I will try to keep this to a not very long sermon today, okay? And not having the, the stream, I mean, having the stream is great usually because, you know, we want to finish on time for, for various things, and not having the stream is a bit dangerous, uh, but again, I promise you we, there'll be much to talk about in your discipleship groups because uh, I, I will leave so much left unsaid. And also, I promise you, if you are very politically engaged, I hope to be an equal opportunity offender today and offend everyone equally. Is that okay? And if I don't cover your particular theological persuasion or bent, I don't apologize for that. Because, uh, again, I'm trying to keep it succinct to uh, what's going to be most helpful. So let's pray and... Um, We'll open up scripture and see what God would have for us. Uh, and so, Father, again, we, like, we've just, like I've just spoken about, our hearts are so easily um, distracted away from you, um, redirected to other passions and desires. We're so prone to look for a saviour in other areas and other places other than you. And so help us, please, Lord. We, uh, I, I'm, I don't want to pray that uh, we, wouldn't, uh, we, you know, we wouldn't be like those other people. That's not my prayer. My prayer is that you would keep us in unity with you and in union with each other. Help us to have a greater understanding of how we can uh, approach and engage in the political realm well for your glory that would represent you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, okay, so, <clears throat> I mean, if you go back... Just the last two years, COVID, there's been a lot of political division and entrenchment in certain tribes and camps. You go back another couple of years uh, into like the, the Brexit, Trump kind of era, there's even more. Uh, we, the, the more that social media has kind of wrapped its tentacles around our lives, the more engaged we are politically, not just at a local level, not just at a national level, but even at the expense of our own national level now, we're engaged politically at a global level. And thinking about politics at this, politi at this global level as well and, and uh, thinking uh, at that level. So what this has done is it's given us many, many, many more categories with which to divide over, like to, to separate ourselves. To go, well, we agree on these 80 things, but this last one, how dare you? How could you... How, you, how, you are like lower than scum because of this one disagreement over here because we have so many category, categories that we can now divide over. Um, seeing people in the last, again, just in the last two years, on all ends of the spectrum uh, and some in the middle who are politically disengaged and don't care and what I want to hope to impress upon you today is that that's not a great place to stay either. So even though a lot of the kind of consternation um, comes at the extremes, like the 10, 15% are either poll, if, if you can like, if you think of it as a spectrum like that, uh, even in the middle, we want to, as Christians, be able to prophetically, and I'll show you from Scripture, prophetically speak into the political realm, not to anchor ourselves at any place along 
a particular political spectrum. We've just come out of a state election this Saturday, a federal election, and so we've been bombarded with those you know, attack ads. Uh, I find it very interesting, again, talking with someone today, that we as a, uh, as a nation have kind of really lent in this, into this more presidential system of, you may know, you know, it won't be easy with Albanese uh, and pictures of ScoMo, you can't trust this liar. Uh, and really, <clears throat> you ask people who you're voting for this Saturday and most people, maybe you, you'll say, oh, I'm voting for this party or this party, or I don't know, or I'm voting for Albanese, or I'm voting for Scott Morrison. Whereas in actual fact, nobody in this room is going to be voting for either of those people uh, because you'll be voting for your local representative and you might not even know the names of your local representatives or all you know about them is a picture and a surname that you see plastered on stubby poles everywhere. And yet you may feel very positively about your chosen candidate and very negatively about another candidate. Here's my, here's my main contention from today, for today, is that if politics is the main lens through which you view the world, then a political outlook or party or platform will tell you what is the good news. Those who disagree with you politically become your enemies that need to be crushed or avoided. Politicians or parties become de facto saviours that save you, deliver you from the hell of the opponent's platform or preferred vision of the future and to the heaven of their, of their vision of their preferred political future. If you primarily view the world through the lens of politics or power, then everything, including theology, including your view of God, including your view of how we relate to one another, will come, become subservient or subject to your view of politics and power. And, and what I want to, again, show you is that most people who leave a church because their politics tell them they have to, have their politics above their theology. I've mentioned this study before, and it blows my mind, uh, and so I want to mention it again. There was a Yale Law School professor, <clears throat> Dan Cahan. He did a research paper, which he called Motivated Numeracy and Enlightened Self-Government. Don't need to worry about that unless you want to go suss it out later. Basically, this is what he did. <clears throat> he wanted to test how being politically entrenched into a political party or political persuasion affected your ability to think. This is what he did. <clears throat> he used a set of data about uh, skin care. Hang on, let me find exactly it. Uh, yeah, whether a skin cream was effective in reducing rashes. So made up data. And that he asked a bunch of different people from all political persuasions, uh, all different education levels to interpret the data. What he found was most people could interpret a politically neutral set of data really well. And the more educated or the more intelligent, the more able these people were to see, well, here's the data and this is what it means. Then he used the exact same data but like erased skin cream and put in a, a few political, like politically hot topics. Went back to those same people and other people and asked them, what does the data mean? What he found was the more educated you were and the more politically engaged you were, the less able you were to correctly interpret the data. Look what he says. He says, the more, like the more politically entrenched, well, I am a Labour supporter, or I am a Liberal supporter, all right? How could you ever vote for a main, main party? I am a staunch independent supporter, or I am a single issue voter, and it is the environment, or it is abortion, or it is the economy. He says, the more you fit into a category like that, the less able you are to think politically, rationally. 
And in fact, the smarter or the more educated you were or the more intelligent you were, you're even less likely to be able to think rationally about politics. So, if, 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 this is our, if this is the state of how humans think, how should we think about politics? Does that mean we should just disengage completely? Because if I'm disengaged, then I will have the margin or the distance to be able to look at politics and think about it rationally and actually be able to interpret the data. <clears throat> oh, I think there's a better way. This is what Paul says or writes to the church in Philippi. He says, uh, in fact, let me paraphrase it for, for today. He says, only live your citizenship in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. He says, only live your life. Part of your life is how you do or do not engage in politics. So I'd say, only let your politics or engage in politics in a manner, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Only do that, is what Paul says. And then he finishes that thought, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. In other words, God is in control. God is sovereign. We want to view the world and things in it, not through the lens of power and politics, but through the lens of God and his scriptures. How does God view the world? What does God think about me? What does God think about us? What does God think about the world? Because that is going to be the truest of true thinking. How do we think like him? Daniel 2, he writes, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. And First Peter, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For it is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honour everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honour the emperor. This is how uh, John Dixon put it. When, uh, he's an Australian histo- theological historian. So the early Christians of, say, the first 300 years, sat so loosely to temporal authority, not because they had a slave mentality, not because they were just completely subjugated or completely in line with the government, as Nietzsche imagined, or because religion was an opiate that dulled them to social reality, as Marx thought, but because they knew that true power to change the world resides not in politics, the the judiciary, or the military, or the media, that's my insert, but in the God of love, And in his call to pray, serve, persuade, and humbly suffer, and history proved them right. And that's why Christians should be the nation's most relaxed and most cheerful citizens, especially in times of political uncertainty. Saying, it's not that we it's not that we disengage, it's not that we just fall into line with whatever the government say says. And it's not that we reject what the government says, and it's not that we're so carefree about it and, and disregard and, and we're disengaged with our politics, but it's that we know, we trust, we have the certainty that God is in control of all politics. So that no matter if whether your guy or girl gets in this Saturday or not, whether the person you least hope gets in or the group you least hope makes government or not, uh, God is still sovereign over all things. That a hope is not I mean, we, we can, you, can still, you can still grieve things, obviously. You can be like, oh, man, I'm disappointed. Or you can be very happy. You can celebrate if your people get in. Uh, but we don't celebrate or grieve as people who have placed all of our hope in a political process. We don't grieve or celebrate as people who view the world th- primarily through the lens of politics. So how do we approach politics in a biblically faithful way? We only live our lives and engage in politics in a, in a manner worthy of the gospel. There's this one um, like thing that happens in the life of Joshua, which I find very instructive for us here. It's from Joshua 5. This is what it says. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us? Or you for our adversaries? So here's the situation. Joshua, in front of Jericho, I don't know if you know this story from the Old Testament, 
where they were going to go and take over Jericho, essentially. Um, but, but there were walls and there were armies and all of a sudden, here's this supernatural being in front of them with a giant sword drawn and Joshua is wondering, oh my goodness, this guy could turn the tide of this whole war, this whole thing. Is he going to help my side win or is he going to help the other guy's side win? And so he goes up and asks him, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And the angel said, no. Doesn't even answer his question. He says, no. No. But I am the commander of the law, the army of Yahweh. And now I have come. He says, are you for us or are you for them? He goes, no. No, I'm the commander of the army of Yahweh. And I, and I am here. This isn't your battle. It's not their battle. It's my battle, actually. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped him and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals, sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Another way to put this in our context is, why well, are you to the left or to the right? Are you... Are you of my political persuasion or are you of the enemy, those evil people who only want to do the evil things all the time? And like the angel, we say, no. No, I'm, 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 with, I'm with the Lord. Uh, he is above those political divisions. He's above those political persuasions. He's above... Uh, a political spectrum that somehow puts care for the environment and care for the unborn uh, on, uh, at, at enmity with each other. Don't understand it. He's got, uh, if we take this and apply to politics, we see God is saying, no, no, I'm not over here and I'm not over there. I'm actually above all. I'm above everything. This is, this is actually my fight. I don't land here. I don't land there. Uh, I will show you what's going to happen. First and foremost, before we consider politics, we consider God, who he is, what he's done, who we were in our rebellion, who we are now, that he has shown his great love and grace towards us in Jesus, who we are to each other, now that we are united in Christ, or with Christ, and united with each other in Christ, this all sits above politics. So politics is subservient to this. Otherwise, people will leave the church of the politics. And I'm not saying there's never a reason to leave a church about politics. When churches submit their theology to politics and say, well, we're a church that plants flag here on political spectrum, that might be a time to think, you know what, uh, it's, I may need to find a new community because you are submitting your ideas about God and the world to your, your priors of your political persuasion. But just like the angel and Joshua, uh, the answer is no. No, 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 we don't plant the flag first. And then go see, well, what theology can we gather that helps to um, back up what we already believe? Let's just, me- just let's meet with people who believe with us only in this political re- uh, sphere. In fact, it is a, I, I put it to you, a significant witness to the world when you, who again might be a diehard Green supporter, can stand next to a diehard UAP supporter and sing praises to God together because of your superior unity in Christ. Does this make sense? You can still go over morning tea, uh, have a delicious vanilla slice, and argue politics, but you argue as brothers and sisters who love each other. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Let me give you a couple of things that I have found helpful with how can we engage politics. Then we'll sing and, uh, and remind ourselves of the God who is above all politics. Uh, 
how do we live this out? How, again, how do we, we, we don't want to fall into the trap of going, well, I'm so glad. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like these people over here, that we've got great unity, but they don't. Oh, thank you that I'm not like those guys. We, we never want to fall into that prideful trap. Uh, but we do, again, what we do want to do is uh, we want to be people who always view the world through the lens of how God uh, has revealed himself and the world to be. Like um, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, we don't want to view people um, from a fleshly perspective anymore. We, we once viewed Jesus through a fleshly perspective, but we don't do so any longer. View it from a Holy Spirit-empowered sense, in, in a sense that uh, God would have us uh, do. And people can disagree about that as well. Let me get to the, uh, how can we do this well? First, we need to remember it is a privilege to live in a place where we can be politically engaged. Phenomenal. Amazing. You get to have a sausage in one hand, pencil in the other, and have some say in who's going to represent you politically and, and to the government, and maybe in government. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Uh, we can vote. You, c- you could, if you're a citizen, potentially even stand for election and say, I will represent the people in this local electorate or in this state. I'll represent you and I'll, I'll try to lead well and govern well. You, you have the ability to do that. In terms of like the history of humanity and even just in the world today, it's not rare in the world today, uh, but it is it's rare in the scope of human history. And it's not universal in the world today by any means. Um, despite what some people would say, separation of church and state does not mean keep your faith out of politics. It means there is no barrier because of your faith to your political engagement. So it means we just bring your political understanding, but understand other people will be bringing other understandings to, uh, to the political engagement. It doesn't mean, well, you're a person of faith, therefore you can't engage in the political sphere. That's not what it means. It means you can go and unashamedly say, well, I think there's a better way and not be prevented from engaging because of your faith. Uh, If you have a government that you don't like, federally, you get another crack in three years to get rid of them. Again, there are places in the world this is not the case. We, We have amazing freedom. It's not just a freedom, it's also a responsibility. One that Australians maybe because of the freedom, because of our peaceful living, because this is one of the safest places to live, most prosperous places that has ever existed. Australia, in the last couple of years, has been the richest, had become the richest nation of individuals in the world. The safest, one of the like, top two safest places in the world. In the world. And in the world in 2022, uh, you could basically say that's de facto has ever existed because uh, in terms of standard of living, length of living, um, in terms of health and in terms of wealth and in terms of freedom, uh, it is unimaginable to most people who have ever lived the freedoms that we have. We're totally taken for granted. So firstly is gratitude to God for where we live. On electing officials, Russell Moore uh, quotes Romans 1.32 and says, the Bible tells us, will be held accountable not only for the evil deeds we do, but also when we give approval to those who practice them. So what we're saying is he's warning us that we have freedom to be able to engage in the political process. What we don't want to do is say, well, this is my person, and because I chose them, because I voted for them, because I backed them, now I back everything that person does. That they are representing me, and therefore I am all in behind this person. Now it says, man, Romans warns us that the way we stay engaged politically as Christians is God is always above our politics and always above who we choose to represent us and certainly above our party so that when you say, oh, I'm voting liberal this weekend, that doesn't mean, oh, I support everything that this person does or this, this party um, is platforming and the character of their representatives. We don't, I mean, I just... From a worldly perspective, that's not a great thing to do. But certainly, how are we going to represent Jesus well? Uh, we can't. There, is, there are no, I mean, maybe there is a politician, but there are no parties that we can do that for in Australia. 
Like I said, this is the Christian party. Even the ones that call themselves Christian parties. Plant a flag here. Secondly, when you vote, vote for a better world, not for an easier life for you. Again, part of the responsibility, how do we represent Jesus well with our vote? We want to participate with what God is doing in the world. That's how Tim Keller puts it. Uh, he says in, in his book, Center Church, uh, there's a narrow focus on the inner individual experience, which doesn't expect or ask how the experience of salvation will change the way we use our money, do our work, create our art, pursue our education, etc. In this kind of Christianity, personal salvation is offered without much thought as to how Christianity substantially changes a people's attitude towards power and powerlessness, art, commerce, cultural rituals, and symbolism. So, so when we approach politics as Christians who want to represent Jesus well, we need to keep in mind the ways God is at work in the world, how he wants us to be a part of that. So we need to consider what's important to Jesus when we vote, when we engage with politics. And I understand this is very difficult um, because how do you... We, we don't have a party that will uh, care for the poor and care for the unborn. We don't have one. Uh, the party that main, wants to maintain religious freedoms is also a party that wants to maintain um, difficulty or mistreatment of refugees. But they're also the party that's advocating most for the unborn. So how do we, how do we use a vote that is, you know, what would, how would Jesus vote? Uh, I don't know. I, have, I don't have that answer. I know I said on social media yesterday, I'll tell you how to vote. Uh, by no means would I ever tell you who to vote for. But in this regard, I'm trying to help you understand how do you, you know, if you look at the more progressive parties who look at things like protecting refugees and um, being good stewards of creation of foreign aid um, are also the ones who are for parental rights over the rights of their children. Uh, larger role for the government, more subjugation of people. Uh, and then the, on the other side, you might see people who are pro-life, more conservative, uh, keeping economy strong, a limited role of government, strong proponent of families, etc. but less and lack of care for the environment, less and lack of care for aid and refugees. Uh, things like this. So I understand it's very difficult. And you already might be in your head going, no, that's not right. My party has everything. Uh, I wonder if we start to fall into the trap of that study we looked at at the beginning where the more entrenched we are, the less able we are to rationally look at a set of data and uh, accurately interpret it. The left says individual needs to be protected from society to live how they want. The right says individual needs protecting from being over-governed and they're both right and they're both wrong. So how do you vote? There are 10 verses in the Bible that emphasize God's love for widows, orphans, and foreigners, like refugees in particular. 10 that mention all three, and dozens and dozens more that mention one or two of the three. I'd say also don't vote with your wallet. So, uh, by all means, vote. Uh, you know, a, a prosperous economy lifts everybody, maybe disparately but certainly lifts everyone, so that's important. Uh, but don't vote primarily about how it's going to affect your wallet. Um, don't be manipulated by fancy rhetoric. Don't be sucked in by politicians who promise you everything. It's impossible. Uh, even, even if um, you can vote you know, a, a number of, uh, on a number of lines that will help you specifically, it still might not be the way you can vote to represent Jesus best in the world. Remember, a lot of politicians' top priority is to gain power, not actually to represent people. It's one of the things that Thomas Sowell said, that no one really understands politics until they understand politicians aren't trying to solve problems, they're trying to solve their own problems, of which getting elected and re-elected are number one and number two, and whatever is number three is far behind. Um, next, I say, again, don't get stuck somewhere on the political spectrum, left to right. 
uh, above that, be pursuing the things of God that will prevent you from ever getting planted on the political spectrum because there is nowhere on the spectrum that perfectly represents God. There's a lot more I would love to say about that. Fourthly, pray for your leaders because it's, because it's a good thing to do, because God answers prayers, because God instructs us to pray for our leaders, especially the ones you don't like, pray for them. And again, Saturday night, if it becomes clear by Saturday night, uh, who your local representative and who the uh, government is going to be, um, pray for them, even if they're not your guys. Pray for them. Uh, Tim Keller, he says, uh, get out and vote for your guy, love the other guy, and pray for both guys. He's using guys in a gender neutral sense there. And Paul Russell Timothy saying, first of all, I urge all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high, posi- high positions, so that we may lead a peaceable and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God, our Saviour, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So again, unsurprisingly, God loves politicians, but Paul's reminding Timothy, pray for those who are in leadership over you, and then rem- reminds them because it is God who is our saviour, not the politicians. So you can pray for them. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be imprecatory prayers where you're praying for their downfall because your hope is not wrapped up in your political adversary's demise. Your hope is wrapped up in the person and work of Jesus. So you can pray for everybody, happily, joyfully, even for people who are doing things you think are ghastly, Pray that God would help them govern in a way that is uh, good for all people. Lastly, don't place your hope on the result. Again, your hope is not in politics. You may leave a church if your hope is in politics and the people around you aren't, aren't hoping in politics. And they think, what's wrong with you people? Can't you see how terrible life is going to be if this person or this party gets in or if my person doesn't get in? or how good it's going to be if my saviour comes and becomes my representative, or our saviour comes and leads the government to our preferred political future slash heaven. No, we don't put our hope in politics at all. Whatever, regardless of what your your representatives are collectively doing, um, you be a peacemaker. You advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves. You work for the good of all. You care for the poor, the widow, the orphan, the alien, the refugee. You care for the disadvantaged. Remember you hear what you're here for is above any of those endeavours. Um, and as we go about doing all of those endeavours, we want to make disciples. Your hope is not in the future of politics. Acts 17, uh, Paul says to the Athenians, from one man, God made every nation that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he's not far from each one of us. This is the hope of humanity. Not politics, not your preferred political party in power, not a utopian one world government and not the opposite of that. None of those things should make you fear and none of those things should make you uh, joyful in in the way that uh, knowing God is in control makes you joyful. So again, be, be joyful or be disappointed but not in the way that those who, have, who don't have the hope of Jesus would be joyful or disappointed. Vote, not with your wallet, um, not with your heart abstract of your mind. Um, vote how, again, as impossible as this is, uh, vote as one representing Jesus. Where you can put your hand on your heart and say, Uh, This is what seems best for my local area, uh, for my state, 
for my country and for me to represent Jesus well. Knowing that you can't possibly back everything that a politician or a party stands for. And if you do, I, I put it to you, you, you probably have fallen into the trap identified in that study at the beginning of the sermon. Untether yourself from your political party or political persuasion. I'm not saying don't be a member. I'm not saying don't run even with a, with a political party. I'm saying untether yourself to being so entrenched in that tribe that you have to start backing things that you shouldn't be backing or being against things that you shouldn't be against. Put God and how he thinks of the world above everything, including your politics. And then we can fulfill Ephesians 4, the call in Ephesians 4, to be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So that we be a church that first and foremost looks to God, seeks God above all things and his kingdom and his ways above all things and that that would inform and impact how we engage in the political process and not the other way around. Let me pray.